This is Roberto Suarez. This is Roberto Suarez, the Secretary General of the International Organization of Employers. We have been already dealing with virtual meetings already for one and a half year. And we always keep saying, keep pushing for the same initial message, messages when we have a, a virtual exchange. Please keep yourself muted and um, use the chat function when you want to make any 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 intervention and um, also we want to convey the message that this is a virtual exchange we come very pertinent right now because of the reality that is coming beyond COVID-19 so we wanted to we already had an exchange on remote work and on telework and uh, we already have the collaboration the involvement of different international organizations and of course ILO, OECD, uh, the WHO what we wanted is to look now a scenario which has evolved in these eight, nine months uh, and to see what's the reality after that and how we can really anticipate the regulations, the policies that are needed to be able to face efficiently the needs, the needs of workers. I mean, the concept of workplace is changing and we already said that before the pandemic. And right, right now what we see is that uh, there is no longer any, uh, a concept of future work is the present of work, which make us work remotely from different from different areas. And we have these hybrid meetings, which also complicate things further. So we have in, in this exchange uh, important panelists, and I want to thank very much all of them because of their availability, the, 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 the non-interested collaboration with IOE. First of all, uh, uh, someone who is a, a very, very, a very important person in Spain, Francisco Pérez de los Cobos, uh, who, is the, who was the former president of the Constitutional Court. Uh, also, I have to say that uh, from, a, from a personal perspective, is someone who has always been collaborating uh, with me uh, as, as, as Roberto, as professional, but, uh, but also with employers' organizations in many sense. So I want to thank very much him for being able and willing to, 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 to provide uh, his inputs here. Uh, beyond that, he he has developed an important expertise on, on the telework uh, regulations uh, from a legal angle. Um, when this telework reality was not so, uh, so extended. Uh, so he has, he has a big uh, input to provide us. We also have with us um, the representative, important representatives with a degree of expertise, which is also what we were looking at um, from the ILO, uh, the International Labor Organization. And thank you, John Messenger for being with us. Uh, from the World Health Organization, uh, Ivan Dimot uh, Ivanov, uh, which is precisely dealing with the occupational health and safety in WHO and never before the collaboration with WHO, uh, IOE, ILO has been so important, but also uh, uh, important expertise from the OECD. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Peter Gall uh, also dealing with issues related to the future of employment and future reality of remote work um, to provide some inputs. We didn't want also to have this exchange without, without uh, a, a, a kind of input from our members. So we, we brought two employee organizations and we didn't want to, to, to spend much time uh, with inputs because we need that, uh, we know that in this new virtual reality, time is of essence. So we brought uh, an important organization in IOE, who is the Union Industrial Argentina, and Laura Jimenez, she, she, she's an expert on, of course, of employment labor relations, but uh, she has been, of course, dealing with the new regulations in Argentina on telework, and it's a, quite an interesting input. Uh, and contrary to what many people think, the, the, the reality of telework is, is not just a reality of developed economies, but also developing economies. And uh, we have a, a, a very distinguished representative of uh, our membership in Senegal, and Ami do Diop, uh, and merci, merci beaucoup pour, pour, pour nous le So I don't want to take much time on presentations. I just want to, to tell you that uh, what we expect is to have an interaction with you, use the chat function, we'll bring the questions to the panelists. We'll have first a presentation by Luis Rodrigo, who together with Rita were the ones working in a report. And uh, you, I think a very, very interesting, interesting report on the reality of the different regulations uh, worldwide, based not just on the uh, on the on information that we got 
uh, from different international organizations, but also based on the inputs of our members. So with no further delay, I will ask Luis to, to present us the, the findings of this, uh, of this report, which is available for everyone. Thank you very much for listening. And Luis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Let me just uh, ask Elodie to stop sharing her screen so I can share, share mine. Um, and, uh, and give you some, some information uh, on the report that we, we have uh, produced, of course. Let me, let me start by, by thanking all our members who, who have contributed to the preparation of, of this report by providing us with inputs, with, uh, with the policy activity that's uh, occurring at their national uh, uh, jurisdictions. And of course, a special thanks uh, go, go to, to our colleagues uh, from ACTEMP who, who were uh, engaging with, with us in the preparation, providing with uh, interesting uh, comments, uh, uh, data, and especially uh, Magda Bover, who, who also engaged in the, with, with the editorial revision of, um, of the report. Uh, and, uh, and, and having said that, let me just tell you how we uh, develop with this, this report and the overall objective. Because when, when you look uh, out there in the internet or you research around, uh, around uh, telework or remote work, you find uh, a wide variety of, uh, of, of information, and uh, in, including the one that, that has been uh, developed by, by IOE. Uh, as Roberto mentioned, we, since the beginning of the pandemic, we were deeply engaged into the, into the topic and developed uh, guidance. And there's a lot of guidance out there, uh, data surveys, and so on. Uh, but but uh, there was nothing with a specific uh, focus, with a specific emphasis on the business policy implications and policy uh, developments at the, at the global uh, level. So what we did uh, is, is that we brought together all this information. We, we took interesting data coming uh, from, from several uh, sources, from several reports and surveys, including uh, those produced by the OECD and the, the ILO, of course, uh, comments uh, coming from, from WHO and, uh, and the regulatory activity, as, uh, as I've mentioned, the regulatory activity that was uh, flagged by, by the IOE uh, uh, members. Uh, and, and with this, we, we ended up producing this, uh, this uh, report uh, with some food for thought and, and for, for you all to, to take a look at, uh, at all those uh, implications around, around the topic. And with the overall aim at building on an observatory of uh, remote work regulations. So we've assessed uh, 30 uh, countries regulation plus the EU. And, uh, and we provided with a with that anal analysis and assessment on on, on various implications uh, that deriving from from all this uh, legislative uh, activity, and uh, and we wanted to to of course highlight the the future regulatory uh, trends uh, and identify challenges and opportunities uh, for for employers. And at the same time, to, to provide uh, four concrete uh, policy recommendations. This is a report that intends to be a, a, a living document. So, so we're going to be using uh, our IOE observatory, or, or, or better known as our newsletter, to keep on updating all those uh, regulatory developments and policy uh, developments uh, on the on the topic. For this report, we 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 put special focus on 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 some policy areas that are the the ones that most uh, interest uh, or or are in the uh, at the forefront of uh, of the discussion, especially working time as one of the major concerns in the policy debates on remote work. Skills demands, of course, as a prevailing challenge, uh, together with uh, technology and the di digital divide. Uh, Robert already mentioned, of course, occupational safety and health, where most existing regulations put a special emphasis and one where we are very attentive to, to, to what uh, WHO uh, thinks on, on, on that uh, field, of course, along with the ILO uh, recommendations. And some considerations around cross-border mobility, tax and social protection uh, implications, uh, 
uh, along with the costs and benefits uh, aspects that are of the best interest of, uh, of, of business. And of course, how can business uh, leverage uh, from remote work or telework uh, to achieve or, or increase their, their pro productivity? This, this is uh, one of the most interesting uh, fields around a telework, whether, whether we can be more productive or more or less productive when engaging into remote work and, and what are the, the implications around, around it. Uh, there are several challenges, limitations and, and, and opportunities, and we wanted to, to shed a light on, uh, on some of these. Just to mention some of uh, the policy recommendations, because th these are extensive and, and, um, and I invite you all to, to read uh, our, our report uh, and, uh, and take a look at these policy uh, recommendations. Uh, one general uh, recommendation that, that we came up with is that, that remote work policies should consider all possible implications, because implications can, can uh, largely vary depending on the type of, of business of sector uh, that you are uh, engaging uh, with. So it's important to clarify expectations uh, and responsibilities, as well as to ensure compliance with all existing uh, regulations. And of course, to engage into the policy making, not, not every jurisdiction as, as clear uh, rules around uh, telework, but we all have to be mindful of uh, all the, the implications. An important aspect is, is uh, that we highlight is self-determination. That, that is the, the aspect of uh, eligibility. So business should identify and determine the, the positions and tasks where telework is, is possible. And, and also engage in, in social social dialogue to to talk about reversibility whether whether it's a, it's a, or not an, a, a, a right or a benefit and how um, internally uh, remote work policies uh, shall be uh, addressed. Working time already mentioned mentioned uh, that important aspect where we have to 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 adopt a new mindset. No no doubt that this is uh, new for for many, and where productivity plays uh, an important uh, role. So so it should be measured based on on, on outcomes rather on than on working hours. And of course. There are some limits that we we, we all should uh, should respect, and we should be transparent and communicate uh, with our workers around those limits. What are the limits? Skills. This is this is uh, one of uh, of the important uh, highlights. Uh, everyone uh, has been dealing uh, with technological challenges that that need uh, needs to. To, to be identified and, of course, promote uh, upskilling within our workforce to, to leverage uh, from, from, from telework. OSH, of course, we call for policies favoring uh, social dialogue and bilateral agreements. Uh, we have to be mindful of, of all the, the restrictions that employers have to, to, to look to, to ensure that, uh, that OSH is a uh, is uh, effectively looked after within within private uh, uh, premises, for example. So that that remains a challenge where a lot of communication uh, is needed. And uh, and uh, finally, the the gender aspect where we recommend to promote an anti-discrimination uh, environment, so so everyone can benefit from remote work and of course leverage from remote work for uh, for inclusion and empowerment of of women. With, the, with, the, with this uh, general... Thank you very much, Luis. I have to cut you because we need to be efficient with our time. I think that the, the conclusions of the report are there. Over uh, to you, Robert. With very concrete policy recommendations, uh, which are on this area. So, eligibility, working time, productivity, skills, occupational health and safety, gender and gender diversity. Um, I now have to floor to... Uh, to the professor. I don't know whether he's there. I think he has yes, and two areas yeah. in which we are asking uh, your, your input. Uh, uh, Francisco Pérez de los Cobos, professor, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. Um, gracias a vosotros. Um, simplemente eh, quería. Eh, un segundito, por favor. Uh, uh, I have just a problem with the. Language, yeah, no, it's okay. 
Uh, sí, hay, hay dos, dos cuestiones importantes eh, que, hemos, que hemos señalado. Uno es uh, your new book, Working at a Distance, examines teleworking from various different angles. But based on your legal expertise as former judge, and, or I would say president of the Constitutional Court in Spain, what do you see as the most concerning, worrying legal issues or challenges in telework? Uh, from a labor regulation perspective. And the second is, we might foresee future legal actions related to remote telework arrangements, which may deter employers' willingness to make use of this practice. And, and, and we know that this is a necessary tool now for the future, okay? What is your advice for us, for employers, to prevent undesired litigation and at the same time taking advantage of the benefits of these modalities? Thank you very much. Eh, muchas gracias de nuevo por estar con Muchas gracias a vosotros. Eh, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, yo creo que mis primeras palabras, como es de rigor, deben ser para agradecer a la Organización Internacional de Empresarios su invitación a participar en este evento. Es para mí un honor compartir este rato con todos ustedes. Me van a permitir que la reflexión que en la reflexión que quiero transmitirles parta de la experiencia española. No solo porque es obviamente la que conozco mejor, sino porque creo que lo, lo sucedido entre nosotros, lo que está sucediendo entre nosotros, permite hacer la valoración general que respondiendo a estas preguntas que me han sido formuladas quisiera trasladar. Cuando se desata la crisis sanitaria provocada por el COVID-19, la tasa de implantación del teletrabajo en España giraba en torno al 4,8% de la población activa. Éramos, por consiguiente, uno de los países europeos en los que este modo de organización del trabajo había alcanzado una implantación escasa. La regulación legal del teletrabajo se encontraba contenida en el artículo 13 del Estatuto de los Trabajadores, un precepto parco y escasamente intervencionista, pero ni siquiera estas características de la regulación laboral consiguieron que se produjera una verdadera implantación de la figura. Había, creo, una cultura industrial reacia al teletrabajo que probablemente esté rebrotando eh, ahora. Eh, la crisis sanitaria obligó a volver los ojos a esta institución que se manifestaría crucial para la continuidad de la actividad productiva de muchas empresas y para la conservación del empleo de muchos trabajadores. A través de un real decreto ley, el gobierno decretó la prioridad legal en favor del trabajo a distancia en los procesos de ajuste productivo que debían producirse como consecuencia del COVID y facilitó la implementación del teletrabajo sobre todo en materia de seguridad y salud laborales, conservando como régimen jurídico este régimen jurídico liberal y parco del artículo 13 del Estatuto de los Trabajadores. Debo decir que la respuesta social a esta previsión legal fue espectacular. El esfuerzo de inversión, de gestión y de acomodación realizado por empresas y trabajadores fue admirable. Es decir, según las cifras disponibles, en el 2020 las empresas españolas invirtieron más de 6.000 millones de euros para llevar a cabo la reorganización necesaria que permitiera, que permitiera implantar el, el teletrabajo en condiciones. Los trabajadores, por su parte, se pusieron a trabajar, a teletrabajar masivamente, a menudo en circunstancias precarias y sin el acompañamiento de la formación y de los medios que hubieran sido necesarios. Fíjese que a mitad de 
a, a mediados de marzo del 2020, teletrabajaban de manera regular en España más de 6,3 millones de personas, es decir, alrededor del 34% de la población activa. Quiero resaltar estos datos porque creo que como resulta evidente esta tasa, de esta tasa de implantación, la pandemia se había convertido en una oportunidad para modernizar nuestras estructuras productivas y permitir la consolidación del trabajo a distancia en nuestra realidad laboral. El clima resultaba particularmente propicio porque la inmensa mayoría de los trabajadores, más del 70%, manifestaban su voluntad de seguir teletrabajando y muchas empresas que hasta entonces se habían manifestado reacias a implantar el teletrabajo, habían tenido, tuvieron la oportunidad de comprobar que este puede ser un instrumento eficaz para mejorar la productividad y la flexibilidad empresarial. Pues bien, en este contexto, eh, el gobierno decide llevar a cabo por real decreto ley, luego convertido el rey en ley, una regulación general del teletrabajo. Una regulación que se elabora sobre dos premisas. La primera es que la nueva regulación no va a ser de aplicación al teletrabajo COVID. Es decir, al teletrabajo que se había implantado o que estaba implantado como consecuencia de la pandemia. Este teletrabajo va a seguir rigiéndose y se rige también a día de hoy por la legislación laboral común y por las escasas normas especiales que se habían dictado para facilitar la implementación del teletrabajo a las que ya he aludido. De acuerdo con la ley vigente, esta situación de diversificación de la regulación, o mejor dicho, de eh, regulación del trabajo covid con la normativa previa, va a mantenerse mientras existan medidas de contención sanitaria. Quiere decirse, por tanto, que la nueva regulación, puesto que estamos todavía ante el teletrabajo COVID, no ha entrado materialmente en vigor. Es decir, es una regulación que está formalmente en vigor, pero que materialmente no regula el teletrabajo, porque el teletrabajo existente en nuestro país es el teletrabajo COVID. La segunda premisa desde la, desde la que se emprende la regulación es que mmm, la nueva regulación va a ser una norma especial respecto de la normativa laboral general y común. Es decir, se rompe con lo que había sido la tradición hasta ahora es decir, el teletrabajo no va a ser un precepto más del Estatuto de los Trabajadores, sino que se dicta una regulación laboral especial que se aparta de la regulación laboral común, introduciendo respecto del teletrabajo novedades que parecen ser una avanzadilla de la reforma laboral que el gobierno desea a cometer en los próximos meses, la reforma laboral con carácter general, al menos así se han presentado algunas de las novedades del teletrabajo. ¿Cuáles son los rasgos definitorios de la nueva normativa? De forma muy esquemática, como podréis imaginar por el tiempo que tengo así. El primero es la complejidad regulatoria. De una parte se deja en un limbo regulatorio aquellos trabajadores que trabajan a distancia menos del 30% de su jornada, porque estos teletrabajadores quedan excluidos de la regulación legal del teletrabajo. De otra, se somete a los trabajadores, estos sí, regulados por el nuevo régimen legal, a una regulación compleja e insegura. Por ejemplo, en materia de modificación del contrato, 
la regulación legal se diversifica en función de si el trabajo que realiza en ese momento el trabajador es presencial o a distancia y si se trata del trabajo a distancia, si la condición de trabajo de que se trate está o no regulada en el acuerdo de trabajo a distancia. Es decir, una complejidad regulatoria y es solo un ejemplo muy notable. El segundo elemento, la segunda característica a mi juicio es la rigidez. Se produce un significativo recorte de los poderes empresariales de dirección y modificación de las condiciones de trabajo. A diferencia de lo que ocurre con la regulación común, en el trabajo a distancia, cualquier modificación de las condiciones contempladas en el acuerdo de trabajo a distancia, aunque concurran causas que puedan justificar la necesidad empresarial de la modificación, requieren el mutuo acuerdo de trabajador y empresario. De suerte que si no hay mutuo acuerdo de trabajador y empresario, el cambio no va a ser posible. A diferencia, insisto, de lo que ocurre con la regulación laboral común. El tercero es su carácter incompleto. La regulación de derechos tan importantes como los de derechos del trabajador a la dotación y mantenimiento de medios y al abono y compensación de gastos es tan parca e insuficiente que es seguro que va a ser fuente de conflictividad judicial. Por poner otro ejemplo, se hablaba antes de la reversibilidad. No se sabe con la ley en la mano si el trabajador tiene o no derecho a la reversibilidad y el empresario. Eh, de otra parte, la norma llama hasta en 22 ocasiones a la autonomía colectiva, lo que significa que sin el concurso de la autonomía colectiva, sencillamente la norma no va a ser practicable. La consecuencia de este escenario legal creado por la reforma es, creo, el que se está produciendo un significativo repliegue del trabajo a distancia, una vuelta paulatina al trabajo presencial, que puede hacer que el, el impresionante experimento que supuso el teletrabajo COVID quede en buena medida frustrado. Piénsese que aún seguimos bajo las reglas del teletrabajo COVID, es decir, sin que el nuevo régimen legal resulte aplicable y ya el retorno a la presencialidad resulta muy notable. Según la encuesta de población activa, solo de marzo a julio de este año, 300.000 trabajadores han vuelto al trabajo presencial y la tendencia va en aumento. Vamos a ver cuando las medidas de contención sanitaria cesen y entre materialmente en vigor la nueva regulación, ¿qué queda de los impresionantes volúmenes de hace solo un año de número de teletrabajadores? Como he señalado, la nueva normativa no es de aplicación a aquellos trabajadores que teletrabajan menos del 30% de su jornada laboral, por lo que la tendencia que parece está imponiéndose es la de un modelo semi-híbrido en el que el trabajador trabaja a distancia no más de un día o día y medio a la semana. De esta forma se consigue evitar la complejidad y las rigideces de la nueva regulación y mantener cierto nivel de trabajo a distancia. Yo creo que la lección que cabe extraer de esta experiencia es que desde el punto de vista empresarial, el teletrabajo requiere una regulación que cumpla básicamente dos requisitos, seguridad jurídica y flexibilidad. Un escenario de incertidumbre desde el punto de vista normativo, es disuasorio para las empresas, como también lo es una regulación que haga del teletrabajo una realidad más rígida que la del tra trabajo presencial, lo que por desgracia va a ser, creo, la realidad española. La ley debe incentivar la modernización de las estructuras productivas, contribuir 
a la adaptación y no disuadirla. No es sensato, finalmente, pues que la combinación del trabajo presencial y del trabajo a distancia la determine la ley y no las necesidades de las empresas y de los, de los trabajadores que desean teletrabajar. Muchas gracias, es cuanto quería transmitiros. Eh, profesor, ha sido una intervención brillante, muy bien trabajada y valoramos además el... Muchas gracias. Eh, en serio, eh, es, es muy interesante. De hecho, ya hay varias preguntas en el, en el chat de organizaciones empresariales de países en vías de desarrollo que, que, que están empezando a, a ver el, el problema y lecciones aprendidas derivadas de una regulación que vista de ser eficaz. ¿no? Eh, eh, habías hablado del tema de la modificación de condiciones de trabajo y precisamente hay una cuestión en este, en este sentido, que es mucho más compleja que en el trabajo, en, el, en la regulación general, por llamarlo de algún modo, eh, el tema de la capacidad eh, del de use variant y del empresario ¿no? para... para para modificar eh, también, eh, bueno, pues no solamente las condiciones, sino otros términos y, y la necesidad de un acuerdo mutuo, que por cierto no se exigía en el acuerdo europeo, eh, yo en esto sí participé, en un acuerdo europeo sobre teletrabajo, eh, donde, bueno, pues esta idea de, de absolutamente acordar todo eh, para, para gestionar de una manera más eficaz eh, los recursos, pues tenía un, un valor importante, pero no tan determinante, ¿no? la cuestión del coste y la, la incertidumbre eh, en torno al mismo, por derivado de una mala regulación, da lugar a una... Eh, has dado una, una cifra eh, de, de teletrabajo en España de 34% durante la pandemia, 34%, eh, puede que se baje a más. Nosotros estamos manejando en países, en de, países desarrollados o en economías formales, ¿no? en economías informales, eh, una, un porcentaje de, de un 20-25% de trabajadores de alguna manera trabajando de uno a tres días, son las cifras que, que estamos manejando, pero es, es un dato en cualquier caso eh, de interés porque, porque vemos que se va a consolidar una tendencia de alguna manera de trabajar a distancia. Ahora las regulaciones tienen un papel que, que jugar. ¿no? Eh, tenemos ahora, eh, hay, hay dos preguntas. Eh, eh, sí, he visto las, las preguntas. La primera es sobre eh, la reversibilidad. Sí. Eh, claro, eh, depende, la, la pregunta versa sobre si eh, eh, la reversibilidad puede ser solicitada tanto por la empresa como por los trabajadores eh, en caso de discrepancia. Eh, Vamos a ver, la regulación legal de la reversibilidad es, como decía, compleja. En buena medida, la ley lo que hace es remitir a la negociación colectiva o a los términos fijados en el acuerdo de trabajo a distancia. Por tanto, va a ser fundamental eh, la redacción de los acuerdos de trabajo a distancia para determinar si estamos o no ante un derecho subjetivo a la reversibilidad y con qué alcance. En todo caso, yo entiendo que eh, si la negociación colectiva o el acuerdo de trabajo a distancia no contemplan la reversibilidad como un derecho subjetivo, no hay tal, aunque hay discusión sobre el particular. La segunda pregunta es cuál es la fundamental diferencia entre el teleworking and remote working that we are doing now under pandemic situation. En España la, la diferencia es muy importante porque el teletrabajo COVID sigue sometido a la legislación laboral común y por tanto todas esas eh, restricciones a los poderes empresariales que incorpora la nueva regula, regulación no, no, se, no rigen para el teletrabajo COVID. Cuando eh, cese el teletrabajo COVID, que nosotros, en nuestro caso, va a ocurrir cuando cesen las eh, medidas sanitarias, eh, de contención sanitaria, dice la norma, en ese supuesto, eh, en ese caso, va a entrar plenamente en vigor la nueva regulación. Muchas gracias. Pues muchas gracias por las dos respuestas. Eh, eh, si 
te quedas con nosotros, verás que hay más preguntas que sacaremos luego conforme los demás panelistas también van interviniendo. De Apreciamos mucho eh, el, el tiempo que has dedicado a, a preparar la, la intervención y también a estar con nosotros. Solo faltaba. Muchas gracias, Muchas gracias. por la invitación. Bueno, tenemos con nosotros también a, a, un, eh, a varios representantes. Ya lo anuncié antes. Eh, well, eh, we, we have John Messenger. John Messenger is the expert on telework from the Working Conditions Department in the ILO. I think he has a, a high degree of expertise and uh, also he's quite vocal in, in his presentation. So, John, thank you very much for joining us. We have two questions for you. You have been working during the past 20 years on teleworking. How, how do you see the future of telework? I mean, what we have been discussing now. I mean, there will be a kind of consolidated trend on telework also in the regulatory framework. Perhaps you can also answer some of the questions uh, that are in the chat function, also the rigidities, as we see it, the rigidities of the, of the regulations that are going to dissent this, uh, no, not incentivize the use of a, of a powerful tool for productivity. But at the same time, also we have to preserve rights of the workers. I mean, we are also very much aware of that. So what's the balance there? And th those are the two questions more or less that we were asking you. So please feel free. Uh, and uh, if, if you can also stick to the time, I would appreciate very much. Okay, muchas, muchas gracias, Roberto. Yes, I will do my best to try to address questions. In fact, I saw some that I'm gonna address that are just part of my presentation. Um, but I wanna start by thanking the IOE for inviting me to participate in this digital conference. I think it's a really good timing for this. Um, it's really, how can I say, it's a key timing because we're just seeing the beginning of a return to the office. I myself am actually back in the office. I only came back uh, to the ILO headquarters office last week. Um, and, and so I myself am beginning my own personal experiment with the hybrid model as it's come to be called, or as I've called for a long time, uh, the partial teleworking model. Now, let me turn, so thank you very much. It's an honor to, be a participant in this conference, let me, let me now focus on the two questions that you've given me. I think, first of all, the full impact of COVID-19 on labor markets really remains to be determined. We've certainly seen that with the explosion in cases. Again, uh, some people are calling it a fourth wave of the Delta variant. I just came back from my home country of the US, my home leave, which was from last year. And I will tell you, um, in certain regions of the US, and particularly the Deep South, the Delta variant is exploding. We thought we were behind, the worst was behind us, and now it doesn't look like it is. Um, I don't think that the United States is alone in that case, but it's, it's really uncertain in the future. But regardless, I think it's very likely the rates of telework are going to remain significantly higher than they were prior uh, to the onset of the pandemic, even after what I call the great pandemic teleworking experiment is over. So uh, that's something I think that's, that's really likely to happen. Early stage research and surveys actually have found that a high percentage of workers would like to telework more frequently than they did prior to the pandemic and even after social distancing restrictions have been lifted. Additionally, some workers I think have realized now that their jobs can be performed outside of traditional office spaces, didn't realize that before. And so now they're more comfortable also using the necessary technology. And they know they can do it this way. They figured out how to do it this way. Would have been nice to have had some training at the beginning, but, uh, but now they figured out kind of how to do it. Finally, as I think you've noted, many business leaders, um, some of whom had previously been resistant to their teams working from home because they didn't know if it was really gonna be effective, have now experienced that it can be done successfully. And thus they're supportive of workers teleworking more frequently. But this requires a number of things, which I'll answer more in the response to your second question. But obviously, as I think you've already said, you got to have the necessary digital infrastructure in place. Um, it's costly. It's an absolutely necessary investment. Um, it's something that has to be done. And in those countries where that's been done, you saw much higher rates of teleworking during the pandemic than those countries where that hasn't been done. It needs to be done really everywhere to the extent that that's practical, given the financial limitations and also teleworkability of jobs. Uh, is strongly related to the occupational structure, including in a particular country. And that includes a variety of factors, and particularly the skills of the workforce. So appropriate skills are critical. However, I believe that post-pandemic teleworking is likely to return to its voluntary and partial or technical nature. I mean, voluntary in the part of both employers 
and employees. And early evidence from the pandemic teleworking experiment confirms that in fact, this mandatory full-time nature of pandemic telework, and that's holding aside Ceteris Paribus, uh, holding everything else equal, including any laws that might've been passed on pandemic teleworking. But this mandatory full-time teleworking, it exacerbates the disadvantages of this work arrangement, um, such as the potential for social isolation, and also for detachment from colleagues and the organization itself, which is a real potential problem. It also exacerbates, uh, exacerbates ergonomic issues because a lot of people don't have proper ergonomic equipment in their home offices. Um, it also tends to exacerbate gender inequalities and challenges for women. And it's particularly the case with mandatory full-time teleworking in the context of school and child facility closures, childcare facility, no schools, no childcare facilities, and you're trying to, 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 to do paid work and, and manage your children and, and maybe homeschool them at the same time, it's almost impossible to do all these things simultaneously. It's, it's really crazy. Um, but that's what people have been asked to do. And it's amazing, frankly, how well that's worked um, for both the employer and the employee, given that nobody was trained in how to do this. Or very few people were trained before the pandemic. In fact, telework, I think in many respects was underdeveloped uh, prior to the pandemic. It was underdeveloped in practice, but also in policy at national level and also at organizational level. Very few companies prior to the pandemic, other than really large ones, had even had teleworking policies. Very few countries had them. Regulations, there were almost no laws or regulations of any kind on telework outside the EU, even fewer on the right to disconnect, which of course is to preserve rest periods for workers. That's a fancy term, right to disconnect, but all it means is rest periods for teleworkers. It's the same concept. Um, and as telework policy and law develop in the future to catch up with practice, I think developing these frameworks should help improve working conditions, even when mandatory full-time telework is used in other critical situations. But it now appears to me post-pandemic telework is going to likely involve a hybrid or blended form of teleworking. That is working part of the time in the office and part of the time remotely, what I've called partial teleworking. In fact, this so-called hybrid model of teleworking has been shown to be the best approach for maximizing its benefits and minimizing its drawbacks, such as in the report that the ILO did. Uh, I was the lead author for the ILO with the European Foundation for Improvement of Living Working Conditions back in 2017. And this mandatory full-time form of teleworking I hope and I believe it should really only be used in exceptional circumstances, such as the current pandemic or other pandemics, epidemics, and possibly for natural disasters as well, such as was done in Japan at the time of the aftermath of the great Japanese earthquake. So that's my response to your first question, sir. Uh, now your second question about how to ensure equal treatment opportunities for both remote and on-site workers. Well, I think this is something we're going to have to work through together, because I think as a result of the pandemic experience, that experiment I talked about, it's going to be necessary to figure out how to promote decent and productive telework for a much larger portion of the workforce than used this work arrangement prior to the pandemic. And during the next very uncertain period as we feel our way along to reopening, workers, employers, and governments are going to have to adapt to a new way of living and working, and that's going to require, frankly, new behaviors and new norms. It's gonna be a challenge, I think, for all of us. Um, the ILO's telework guide, which I developed for the ILO, teleworking during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond, a practical guide is just that. It's practical, it's practice focused. It's about concrete recommendations regarding effective teleworking practices. It's focused on eight key areas, a number of which you've mentioned um, and uh, other speakers have mentioned so far, and I'm sure will be mentioned in the future, um, that these key eight areas affect both employee well-being and the performance of individuals and teams. They're key for both. They are working time and work organization, performance management, digitalization, communications, occupational safety and health, legal and contractual implications, training, and work-life balance. In implementing these recommendations with a small r, obviously it's nothing formally adopted by the ILO, they're my recommendations, but they'll help to make the remote working experience, I think, as similar as possible to the office experience. I think that should be the goal. Try to make the remote work experience as close as possible 
to the office experience, and that in turn will help to promote equal treatment and opportunities for both remote and, and on-site workers. And in fact, the hybrid model, the nature of hybrid work itself helps promote equal treatment and opportunities for both remote and on-site workers because you're working in both places, just like I am now. I'm 50% at home. I'm 50% in the office. I'm going back and forth, and I'm just getting started on it. But, but by definition, almost, it helps to equalize um, treatment and opportunities for workers because you work in both places. You're both. You're not a remote worker or an office worker. You're both. And finally, and in conclusion, I think it's essential to ensure the social partners play a central role in drawing out the lessons learned from the pandemic teleworking experiment and applying them to revise existing laws, regulations, and policies at all levels, all levels, or if necessary, to develop new ones for this new situation, and that together they can help make teleworking a true win-win arrangement benefiting both workers and employers in private enterprises, as well as public sector organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you to you, John. I think having an excellent intervention and also very passionate, I have to say. Uh, I, I, I would have one question for you. Yes, of course. Uh, tricky question. Okay. Uh, They're almost all tricky. Law. They're Perhaps almost all tricky. Fiction. <laughs> science fiction, but I'm not going to raise now because we are uh, running out of time. Just think about that. Sometimes regulations as are restricted, so restricted that they are killing, and I want to use this word, killing opportunities of teleworking for workers and employers. So what not to do? And that's what I, I want you to think. What not to do when you apply new regulations or new, okay? I know that it's tricky for the ILO because we know well the history, but I think it's important that uh, we provide guidance on what not to do, uh, what not to regulate on how, how, how counterproductive that can be, okay? Yeah, think about that if you don't mind, okay? Because you just think about it. You don't want me to respond okay. to it right now. Okay. Peter. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. There are two items for you, productivity and telework. I mean, and you have been dealing with that, how that can increase, but at the same time, what are the risks? I mean, in, in terms of creativity and innovation, it's not always easy. I mean, when you are working at home to be so creative than where you are at the office, when you have a kind of build, team building perspective, which uh, also fresh <coughs> your thinking, your interaction with others. So thank you very much for your time again. Thank you very much, Roberto, and for, for all the organizers for having identified our work. Thank you for inviting us. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, and it's a challenge to, to talk after such a distinguished expert in a topic like John. And we are new to this, uh, to this topic. The OECD, um, of course, addressed, tried to address this issue as the pandemic started. And our work is an example of that. So um, I'm looking at it from the productivity uh, side. Uh, in the Global Forum on Productivity, we um, prepared uh, a, an early a response to the telework by putting forward some of the key uh, challenges, both from a worker and the manager in point of view, as, as John also said, these two, two aspects are critical, and also to, to give uh, some guidance to policymakers. And then later on, when we did this uh, early note, we realized it would be good to gather some, some, some new systematic evidence, and that's why we um, wanted to utilize our network to um, employers and employees, and we conducted a survey among uh, 25 countries and several uh, thousands um, of respondents, both the managers and workers. And I want to set the scene to responding to your, to your questions first by um, laying out some of the key results from this uh, questionnaire that we had. Um, as I said, this is a joint work by many of us in the OECD. Let me just uh, say their names, Chiara Criscolo, Timo Leidecker, Francesco Lozman, Giuseppe Nicoletti. Uh, it's a really team effort. And also we were supported by the network of employers and employees at the OECD, BIAC, TUAC, and, and some others uh, as well. So with that, let me just um, uh, present the first uh, key takeaway from, from our survey that is perhaps uh, useful to, um, to, to put on the table. I'm sure everyone uh, knows this from personal experience and has, has read it in a, in a popular press, but I just wanted to share that um, according to our, our surveys, which we, we recovered not only um, the main sectors where telework is happening, but also other sectors, through manufacturing, construction, where there are some office workers who whose work could be done in a telework mode. We see that across, across the board uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic, there was an important increase in, in telework. Uh, the most um, pertinent, of course, happened in knowledge intensive services, such as ICT and finance, professional services, and so where it uh, nearly doubled from 40% to 80%. By telework here, we mean the regular uh, teleworkers, which we define by working at least one day per week. 
uh, out, away from the office at home or in other places. And then um, after the, the pandemic, the key question is what happens after the pandemic? So we also addressed this in our questionnaire and we asked both employers and employees, and this is the uh, re result from employers, from managers, what is their desired level of telework um, after the, the COVID-19 pandemic? And not surprisingly, they still foresee a much higher level of telework than it happened before. So we see that indeed um, the COVID-19 work is a catalyzer breaking down the stigma of telework and, and, and really it's opened up a much uh, more widespread practice, not only in, during the pandemic, but also in the expectations after the pandemic. Um, so that's one of the key takeaways, but of course, what happened during the pandemic was an extreme situation. There, it's a ceiling uh, compared to what they want to do after in terms of uh, teleworking. So the expected levels after COVID, they're all below, of course, the experience level what happened during the pandemic. Another interesting result we had is, is uh, what is the amount of telework that managers and workers desire uh, to occur after the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of the intensity, the number of um, days per week. And here we see an interesting result that also came out from other surveys that were done, um, for instance, in the United Kingdom by Nick Bloom and, and his co-authors, that there is a, a tendency to prefer an intermediate level of, of telework, two, three days per week. And it's the case both by managers and also by workers. Here you see the distribution of, of the workforce uh, in terms of their responses, who prefer five days, four days, three days, two days, one days, and less than one days. And you see that the largest uh, segment of the workers responded three days and two days. And it's the same also for managers, even if managers uh, prefer to have a lower level of regular teleworkers out of the total workforce. But they, but they converge on this, on this idea that the intermediate level is the most uh, attractive one, which is consistent with what, the, what John mentioned, the partial telework or hybrid mode. So really, this is what we are thinking of for the future. Another interesting aspect that came from the questionnaire and that responds already to, to one of your questions is about uh, what should be the main changes in terms of managerial and HR practices to maximize the gains from telework. And we, we put forward a number of, um, of uh, responses, potential responses for, for our respondents. And the main, um, main response that came out at the maximum, both from workers and managers, was the coordination of schedules. What does this mean? It means that in order to maximize the benefits of telework, you need to ensure that at least sometime people are meeting and I think we are losing Peter. Peter, can you hear us? No, I think we'll lose you. Um, is that all right? I, I think, Peter, we cannot hear you. Let's try, let's try someone to call him. Uh, I don't know, Luis, Elodie, and meanwhile, we go to another speaker. Peter? OK. So let's, let's do the following. Uh, sorry, uh, Elodie, if you can liaise with Peter and, and we'll list with other speaker. Meanwhile, because we have also with us Ivan Dimot uh, Ivanov from, from WHO and uh, leading also with Head Occupational Safety at the World and, um, Health Organization. And we have two questions also for, for you, Ivan. Um, meanwhile, we try to solve the problem with Peter because he keeps talking. He doesn't realize that we are not hearing him. So, uh, Ivan, we are aware that employers have limited control over health and safety measures in a remote working environment. What should be the approach of policymakers towards security, securing and health and safety environment at the workplace for remote workers? That's the main question. I mean, this is always a tricky area health and safety at the workplace when the workplace is remotely and especially when it's your home, okay? So whether, I don't know whether you can provide us your input. Meanwhile, I will ask uh, Elodie and, Elodie and uh, Luis to deal with the issue that we have with Peter and we'll come back to him so that he can finish his presentation. So thank you, Ivan. 
Yes, uh, th thank you, Roberto. And uh, my pleasure to be again with you. And uh, thank you for inviting WHO to this meeting. Uh, we are, as you know, we are working with the ILO to develop a technical brief on healthy and safe teleworking. And I uh, was uh, very uh, anxious, anxious, anxious actually to to attend this meeting and to, to hear the, the discussion and uh, what are the issues at, at, at stake. Uh, so with regards to uh, the control of employers, yes, it is true, employers do not have a control over the homes of people and uh, do not have control over the community, but uh, the employers do have control over the equipment, over the, the workstation, that uh, people use for uh, for teleworking and uh, they do have control on the way the, the work is organized on the way the tasks are distributed on the way of management on the communication uh, so they they do have a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities and also uh, employers uh, they can uh, they can stimulate uh, uh, measures for uh, maintaining health and safety even uh, at home, like uh, co many companies have uh, policies for smoke-free workplaces. And uh, it is possible for an employer to say that the workers are expected to uh, <clears throat> maintain that behavior also while they are working from home. Please don't smoke on their desks. At least don't show up with a cigarette uh, in a video conference, let alone uh, smoking marijuana or engaging in uh, consumption of alcohol during, during working hours. Uh, but also WHO uh, has issued uh, guidelines on healthy, on housing and health that provide also a lot of uh, recommendations on how healthy housing can be organized. And that really also brings the attention when you said policymakers and uh, our policymakers are not only the governments, but the national governments, ministries of health, ministries of labor, but also the local governments. And uh, I'm aware many local communities are actually actively attracting teleworkers and creating conditions for teleworkers to, to come and uh, settle in, in, in the community. So our uh, countries and uh, our communities, they, for example, they have regulations for community noise, which can interfere certainly with teleworking and uh, they can be enforced. Uh, but uh, uh, also uh, policymakers in the community, for example, they can make arrangements for making, making healthy choices easier, stimulate smoke-free homes and prevent fires in addition to, of course, uh, the harm of uh, tobacco smoke on health, uh, increase opportunities for outdoor physical activity, uh, enable to handle domestic violence or improve handling of uh, cases of domestic violence. And the provision of high-speed internet and electricity is very important. And also to stimulate the provision of health services in the communities where the teleworkers can get some, some basic services, for example, if they need an occupational therapy to set their workstation or an ergonomist, uh, if they need uh, uh, <clears throat> to, to do some medical checks, uh, some countries there are already community-based occupational health clinics, uh, provision of mental health and psychosocial support in the community and uh, health information about uh, teleworking. And uh, that means that local authorities also need to be aware about the number of teleworkers in the community like they are aware for uh, whether they are migrant workers in the community, like they are aware of any kind of other workers in the community, they should be also aware about uh, uh, the number of teleworkers in the community. And at the national level, that certainly requires a very close collaboration between the health and the labor ministries and the, of course the social partners. When regulations are made that these regulations uh, are really prevention by design. They make arrangements that stimulate uh, healthy choices, that stimulate the protection of health and safety and to not aggravate the situation. Over. Thank you very much, Ivan. I, I think that you raised points that are very relevant with, and we have noticed that during the pandemic, 
even though the pandemic telework is not the same as the telework we'll have in the future, but mental health, uh, domestic violence is, is, a, is incredibly an issue in, uh, in many developing economies because of telework, and, but also in developing economies. Uh, you refer also to exercise. I mean, uh, also the fact that uh, uh, the, perhaps one of the advantages that we have with teleworking is that you have more time also to do you know, a, a more private, uh, private life consultation and you'll have more time, but also you refer to smoking, which is uh, quite an interesting perspective that we didn't, we were not perhaps so much uh, reflect on that. And, and the fact that the, the, the fact that you are at, at home uh, means that you are more and more uh, inclined also to do unhealthy activities compared with the ones that you do at the, at the workplace. Those are very interesting points and we'll come back to them. So we have Peter Gall, uh, we lost you uh, because of uh, you know, uh, connectivity issues or, 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 or challenges. And uh, you were already, already raising some important points. And uh, one of the ones findings that uh, your survey gave us is the, the fact that uh, I mean, on how has evolved during the pandemic the the, the willingness for managers and workers to do telework. And that, that was quite an interesting, but you were finishing your presentation. If you just can use two or three minutes to, to finish it, that we would appreciate. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? We can hear you perfectly. Okay, thank great, great, great. The video doesn't start, but it's okay. Let's, uh, okay, I will start the video as well. Great, I hope I will not, it hasn't happened before. It's a great example of what, what can go wrong with the remote uh, meetings. So I was just there with the, one of the key results of the coordination of schedules. And I wanted to explain that this came out as a, as a main uh, organizational management and HR change that, um, that uh, companies should introduce in order to maximize the benefits of, at least in some occasions, um, both uh, all the team members and both managers and workers can meet in person so they can benefit from you know ad hoc interactions informal discussions that are in many situations they are the key for developing creativity and coming up with new ideas um, room for collaboration between teams or between different uh, different different teams or, or the same uh, within the same team different team members this was one of the main main things and here we mean not, not uh, the precise coordination of, of everyone's agendas, but just to make sure that at least on one or two days, um, there is um, expected presence at the office so that people can benefit from personal interactions. The other uh, features that uh, came out is uh, important for maximizing the gains from telework is of course to uh, ensure there is an adequate provision of uh, appropriate ICT equipment. And there are probably investments, but not only the company side, but also at the, at the worker side. And there may be some support for home equipment and ICT equipment. The, the final part is about skills, the training both of managers to manage remote and hybrid teams. The other thing is uh, hard skills of workers, meaning um, better uh, using digital tools for which of course the COVID-19 was a, was a great push and everyone had to learn this, would have been, as John said, would have been easier or better to do it in advance, but now we got this push and, and of course we need to build on this and not, uh, not, not go back. And the third thing is, is the soft skill aspects to, to, to really um, help um, people who, did not, who were not used to work independently to be able to do so now, and also for managers to be able to manage uh, people who, who, who were not used to work independently, but now they to do it and, and coordinate remotely and sometimes on site. And the final point I wanted to just, uh, just show is that interestingly, managers were more passive when it came to the future, um, future desired steps to maximize the labor gains. Uh, there were a much larger per uh, percentage of them who responded that no changes should be introduced uh, than, than for, for workers. And there are further results from our survey on our website. But let Thank me you. come to the, oh, to, sorry. The policy, to the policy uh, point of view. Uh, so, so far we discussed the managers and, and, and workers, and now I want to uh, tackle the issue of, of policy uh, makers. And here we came up with a three-pronged uh, approach. Of course, it has many, many areas, but we want to group them around three areas. One is enable, second is empower, the third is protect. And what do we mean by here? Um, it's very similar to what John mentioned, but, but structured in a bit uh, different manner. So the first is enable. Enable um, workers and companies who wish to do telework to do so. And it has, of course, the infrastructure element, ICT uh, equipment that I mentioned, to facilitate the investments in these and to, to ensure that broadband is reached, broadband internet connections reach not only to urban areas, but to rural areas. 
And the second is, of course, childcare, which would help with the gender aspect of, of, uh, of enabling telework so that, uh, you know, women can, and, and the, the voluntary work either at the office or at home so that women can choose more freely if there is childcare available. The other is, um, is, is, is culture so that, you know, and managers and, and workers and team leaders are used to have uh, such a corporate culture when they trust the employees, they trust the digital tools. And one thing that uh, can actually uh, support this is to have to introduce digital public services which also um, increase the trust in, in digital uh, tools more generally. For instance, here in, in France, we see a great development in, in a lot of areas and digital services, and this could also uh, increase the trust of, uh, of, all, of all users of such services and that can they transmit to the workplace. And the second uh, group of uh, areas is to empower to empower um, not only uh, workers, but also managers. It comes back to the training that I mentioned, uh, online training, lifelong learning. Governments can play a big role in supporting such uh, trainings, giving companies um, incentives to, to ensure that their workers can, can benefit from such training, uh, both uh, for managers, but also for, for workers. And the final point is, is the protect element. As this is again, John, John mentioned the concept of right to disconnect. And again, in France, we, we have uh, such law in place, I believe. This is about ensuring that there is adequate uh, you know, rest time for workers and, and also that the working times are not getting too long compared to the situation when, when people used to go to the office. And the final aspect is, of course, adapting and revising the regulations to the new reality. And this is a critical and challenging issue that needs to be dealt with. In a, in a context of a social dialogue with, 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 all, with all partners, employers and employees allow them alike of how to adjust the health insurance and the safety regulations to the situation where, where not all the uh, work week is carried out uh, in the office. With that, I want to uh, close this presentation and I think I addressed most of the questions with this, uh, but if you have more. Um, yeah, and even some questions that we have in the chat function, I think yes. it's related to the willingness of employers and workers, but also you know, the disconnection, not disconnection is something that we discuss in the ALO. I mean, not as a right as such, but uh, the importance of human resources policy. And if you refer to the cultural issue, I mean, you cannot make a distinction between teleworkers and not teleworkers. At the end, you need a kind of cohesive corporate culture and company culture, yes. which is uh, challenging. I mean, when you have people in the distance and trying to bring them together in a kind of cohesive team building approach, same values, it's not so easy. It's not so easy. So let's go now to our members. And we have uh, uh, selected two important federations. One, and you'll see that uh, the, the approach is completely different. And I will turn into French. Uh, and nous avons uh, Monsieur Diop. Uh, Monsieur Diop, c'est le secrétaire général du Conseil national du patronat du Sénégal. Um, and Sénégal has, uh, has uh, uh, publié récemment un document, une recherche sur les défis de employeurs dans le télévoir, dans le télétravail. Et, mais cela dit, il faut, il faut dire que, que le niveau de connexion, le niveau d'infrastructure de, de dans des pays en voie de développement avec des, des, une informalité grande n'est pas le même. C'est-à-dire avoir une politique de télévoir de, de travail à distance en, en France n'a rien à voir avec ce qu'on peut faire en, en Sénégal. Pour beaucoup, de, pour beaucoup de raisons. Alors, nous voudrons euh, mettre, mettre, mettre sur le point cet, cet élément dans la discussion, de manière que, que Amidou, euh, tu peux tu nous, nous donner aussi euh, cette, cette perspective d'une fédération d'un pays en voie de développement et avec une informalité, une formalité grande. Merci de ton temps et ton engagement avec nous. Je vous remercie de me donner la parole. Tout d'abord, nos félicitations à notre secrétaire général, Roberto, pour l'initiative de cette conférence et également nos remerciements à Actem pour son précieux concours à la réalisation de notre publication que nous avons intitulée « L'œil ouvert des employeurs sur le télétravail au Sénégal, enjeux et perspectives ». Alors, je dois dire que nous avons engagé très tôt des travaux approfondis sur l'impact de la COVID dans nos entreprises, car premièrement, le virus avait engendré des fractures économiques, financières et sociales au niveau national. Et deuxièmement, le virus s'était introduit dans les relations contractuelles et l'organisation du travail en milieu professionnel avec des conséquences majeures dans la gouvernance de nos entreprises. 
En conséquence, de nombreuses, entre de nombreuses entreprises avaient eu recours au télétravail afin de procéder à des ajustements sociaux et de flexibilité au travail, indispensables d'une part pour la continuité de leurs activités et d'autre part, bien entendu, pour la protection sanitaire des travailleurs. Il a été ainsi noté que le travail a été mis en pratique sans aucun avenant au contrat de travail, sans formalisme et également ni encadrement. Cette pandémie sanitaire venait tout simplement de révéler l'existence d'un vide juridique et réglementaire dans notre législation du travail. Dès lors, il était de notre responsabilité d'avoir une vision prospective des nouveaux rapports contractuels employeurs et travailleurs en prenant en compte les mutations technologiques et l'évolution de la transformation digitale. Ainsi, euh, si je peux dire, la première difficulté à laquelle nous sommes heurtés porte sur la définition du, du télétravail. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'on dit Est-ce qu'il fallait dire travail à domicile, travail à distance Nous avons dit non. La définition du télétravail devait être plus précise. Et nous avons obtenu comme définition toute prestation de travail effectuée totalement ou en partie hors des locaux de l'entreprise sur un lieu de travail bien déterminé et en utilisant les technologies de l'information et de la communication. Ce qui signifie que le choix du télétravail peut se faire en dehors du domicile et que le travail à distance devait se faire obligatoirement, bien entendu, en utilisant les, te les, les technologies de l'information et de la communication. Ceci nous a amené à percevoir très rapidement euh, de nouveaux enjeux euh, relatifs aux télétravailleurs résidents à l'étranger ou transfrontaliers euh, de demain, à savoir quel type de contrat de travail, protection sociale, l'imposition fiscale, les procédures de règlement différents, autant de questions auxquelles il était nécessaire pour nous de nous pencher dès à présent au regard de l'évolution du numérique. Ensuite, euh, il nous fallait euh, une réponse euh, à la question « Qui a pris l'initiative de mise au télétravail dans les entreprises ?» Et là, euh, nous avons noté que l'introduction du télétravail a été faite dans la grande majorité des entreprises sur la base d'une consultation et d'un volontariat. L'initiative de mise au télétravail a été prise par l'employeur dans les deux tiers des cas. Le tiers restant venant euh, des autres responsables des directions euh, de l'entreprise Cependant, et c'est important, il n'y a eu aucune proposition de la part des syndicats de travailleurs et des délégués du personnel. Puis à la question, quels sont les, les, les secteurs d'activité et les postes mis au télétravail Il s'est agi principalement des secteurs de, des services, hein, donc les banques, les assurances, le numérique, le commerce, la formation et les professions libérales. Concernant les postes mis au télétravail, ils sont relatifs aux fonctions administratives, financières, ressources humaines et commerciales. Ce qui s'explique, il faut dire parfaitement, euh, car dans ces différents postes, l'utilisation euh, des TIC s'est avérée possible. Mais il y a aussi eu un système de rotation en présentiel et en télétravail pour le personnel concerné. Si l'on regarde euh, la, maintenant la perception euh, des employeurs euh, des trois principaux avantages du télétravail. Ils nous ont souligné d'abord euh, la baisse des charges fixes de fonctionnement de l'entreprise, puis une grande flexibilité euh, des horaires de travail, ensuite une meilleure conciliation entre vie professionnelle et vie privée. Quant à la productivité du travail, vous avez seulement un employeur sur dix qui souligne une légère augmentation de l'efficacité des travailleurs. Globalement, euh, les employeurs ont précisé euh, qu'ils avaient quatre difficultés majeures dans la gestion des performances des télétravailleurs qui étaient liées premièrement à la qualité de la connexion Internet du travailleur. Il s'est effectivement posé le, le problème de la capacité réelle et du haut débit de la connexion Internet sans oublier la prise en charge euh, de l'abonnement. Deuxièmement, euh, c'est euh, les conditions de travail à domicile. Les travailleurs ne disposaient pas d'un local approprié à la maison et suffisamment isolés de l'espace familial. 
Troisièmement, le contrôle effectif du temps de travail. Et quatrièmement, vous aviez la confidentialité et la sécurisation des données de l'entreprise. Nous avons aussi demandé aux travailleurs leur perception du télétravail et nous avons noté qu'ils étaient tous ravis. Gain de temps, plus de souplesse, meilleure flexibilité des horaires de travail, réduction du stress et de la fatigue, plus d'autonomie et de responsabilité, meilleure conciliation, vie privée et vie professionnelle. Que du bonheur, hein? vraiment que du bonheur en quelque sorte, si je peux le dire. Par contre, en fonction du genre, il y a eu deux fois moins de femmes que d'hommes qui ont pu concilier euh, vie professionnelle et vie privée et aussi ressentir une réduction du stress et de la fatigue. Globalement, les travailleurs reconnaissent tout de même qu'il existe des freins socio-culturels au télétravail, à domicile. Visite au nu, euh, vous avez la, la visite inopinée familiale, euh, les problèmes de promiscuité qui se posent et également euh, la qualité de la connexion interne. En conclusion, nous avons élaboré un document de plaidoyer des employeurs avec des propositions. Premièrement, au titre du corpus juridique, où il s'est agi d'intégrer le télétravail dans la législation sociale, tout en précisant que la décision de mise en œuvre du télétravail est une prérogative de l'employeur, et ce, même en cas de choc exogène. Ensuite, que les métiers et postes de travail éligibles au, au télétravail sont également déterminés par l'employeur et que la question de la territorialité du travailleur de demain soit également examinée. Deuxièmement, au titre du statut euh, du télétravailleur, où il s'est agi de promouvoir des dispositions contractuelles d'engagement et d'exclusivité du travailleur à respecter vis-à-vis -vis de l'employeur, ainsi que des obligations de confidentialité et de sécurisation des données. Troisièmement, au titre des conditions de travail du télétravailleur, où il s'est agi de définir clairement les règles de gestion du temps de travail, des risques professionnels, de la préservation de la vie privée et de la santé mentale, ainsi que de la prise en charge des outils du télétravail. Et enfin, au titre des garanties et des dispositions à prendre par l'employeur, où il s'est agi là, de formaliser la politique de mise en place du télétravail avec des procédures de contractualisation, mais surtout des règlements des différents. Maintenant, vous avez raison de, 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 de souligner le faible pourcentage d'accès à Internet en Afrique. Je souligne que ce pourcentage, que ce pourcentage est d'ailleurs très disparate d'un pays à un autre en fonction du nombre de câbles sous-marins de fibres. Ensuite, il faut bien comprendre que l'une des particularités de l'Afrique est que c'est le téléphone mobile qui porte cette transition numérique-là. Ainsi, plus de la moitié des connexions à Internet passent par le téléphone mobile plutôt que par un ordinateur. Donc, vous avez au final très peu de travailleurs qui disposent d'un ordinateur ainsi que d'une connexion au débit à domicile et sécurisée. Donc, aux entreprises, Très peu sont dans de bonnes dispositions pour doter leurs leur télétrava leur télétravailleurs des équipements nécessaires. L'effet levier euh, viendra très certainement euh, de la productivité effective du télétravailleur. Les employés ne pouvant être mis au télétravail ont dû se conformer euh, aux dispositifs de protection sanitaire mis en place dans les entreprises. Il y a eu euh, effectivement euh, des rotations en présentiel du personnel et en payant, bien entendu, au moins 70 des salaires et des réaménagements de postes de travail. Quant à la numérisation future de l'Afrique, je pense que nous assistons déjà à l'émergence d'une nouvelle économie africaine du numérique dans des secteurs porteurs de croissance, notamment les services financiers, le e-commerce, le e-santé, le e-environnement et l'urbanisation, le e-formation. Et en plus, vous avez euh, des administrations publiques africaines qui se sont lancées dans de grands chantiers de dématérialisation, de télédéclaration et de télépaiement. Le principal défi de l'Afrique, c'est de capter le dividende euh, démographique d'ici 2025, couplé à la transition euh, numérique et écologique.
Voilà. Je et une intervention aussi très, très détaillée, Amidou, euh, et aussi très nuancée, mais très surprenant aussi. Euh, de temps en temps, on ne se raconte pas du de, de niveau d'approfondissement de, de, que vous avez fait aussi dans, dans un pays comme Sénégal. Et mes félicitations. Et, Laura, euh, no te deberíamos haber dejado la última. Eh, eso es una cosa que, que además eres, eh, es un tema, un tema importante para nosotros, el, el, el balance de género en, nuestras, en nuestros paneles. Eh, es algo además que llevamos muy, muy, muy en serio nosotros. Eh, un país como Argentina, eh, con tantos también contrastes, pero también tan, tan, eh, eh, tan desarrollado en algunos aspectos. ¿Cómo está gestionando la realidad de teletrabajo y cómo una organización tan importante como la Unión Industrial Argentina lo está, lo está gestionando? ¿no? Sabemos que ha habido nuevas regulaciones y, nuevos, eh, no, y nuevas iniciativas. ¿no? Eh, si lo puedes hacer de la manera más breve posible, porque luego habrá preguntas, te lo agradecemos muchísimo. Eh, muchas gracias, Roberto. Permitidme sumarme a las felicitaciones al equipo de hoy por el informe publicado hoy y reiterar mi agradecimiento por permitirme eh, participar junto a estos destacados colegas. Para mí es, es un honor y creo que han ilustrado cuestiones muy pertinentes. Eh, en la Unión Industrial Argentina veníamos investigando y trabajando sobre el trabajo remoto conectado desde hace muchos años, eh, mucho antes incluso de la pandemia, eh, y habíamos participado en instancias de diálogo nacional para discutir iniciativas regulatorias. Eh, y hasta podemos decir que contábamos con cierto consenso doctrinal en cuanto a varios principios que, que deberían regir el teletrabajo, eh, pero era un consenso entre especialistas o un consenso entre ciertos sectores. ¿no? Y en el 2020 este panorama cambió. Eh, en primer lugar, porque con motivo de las restricciones sanitarias, el teletrabajo dejó de ser excepcional, dejó de ser incluso un beneficio para algunos trabajadores, eh, y se convirtió en una herramienta que permitió asegurar la continuidad de muchas empresas y muchos sectores productivos, eh, incluso eh, los servicios públicos de justicia, de educación y algunas prestaciones de salud. En este escenario tuvimos que discutir una nueva regulación con nuevos actores que no estaban previamente involucrados en la discusión, eh, y tuvimos un debate en el Congreso de la Nación que se dio en tiempos excepcionales, con actores excepcionales, eh, pero que tenía que producir una norma eficiente para regular el mercado de trabajo a largo plazo, y eso eh, supuso algunos desafíos. Primero, para acceder a participar y a dialogar con el poder legislativo, y segundo, para poder comunicar algunas de estas experiencias de cómo funcionaba en la práctica el trabajo remoto, eh, y de cómo se organiza el trabajo en algunas ramas de la industria que lo venían aplicando. Eh, en cuanto a los retos que se que planteó la regulación en Argentina, voy a, men a mencionar algunos que están parcialmente resueltos y otros que vamos a deber resolver en el corto plazo. El primero fue la entrada en vigencia de la norma eh, frente a la situación de emergencia, se dio una situación similar eh, a la de España. Eh, en la ley nacional el trabajo remoto solo puede adoptarse como fruto de acuerdo entre las partes y a la fecha en que fue sancionada, que fue en agosto del 2020, la mayoría de los trabajadores que estaban ocupados en, en teletrabajo eh, lo hacían a causa de cumplimiento de las restricciones sanitarias. Eh, esto se resolvió en primer lugar con una cláusula que postergó la entrada en vigencia hasta la finalización del aislamiento social preventivo y obligatorio, que eh, fue el, el nombre que adoptó en Argentina eh, la etapa más restrictiva de, del aislamiento social. Entonces se pospuso la entrada en vigencia hasta 90 días luego de que finalizase esa etapa, planteándolo como una etapa de, de adaptación para que las empresas pudiesen decidir, eh, junto a los trabajadores, si lo conveniente era continuar con la modalidad remota o no. Eh, pero se, seguidamente, y atendiendo a, a que empezamos a entender mejor este carácter dinámico de las etapas de prevención sanitaria, eh, se dictó una resolución que aclaraba que en ningún caso estas restricciones sanitarias podían suplir la voluntad de las partes. Aunque hubiésemos pasado ya etapas de restricciones generales, nos encontramos con muchas eh, restricciones por protocolos sanitarios o de prevención eh, por periodos breves de tiempo que obligaban de nuevo a los trabajadores a, a funcionar en forma remota o incluso a trabajar en estas modalidades mixtas que, que mencionábamos eh, recién. Eh, en segundo lugar, hay muchos desafíos técnicos que planteó la regulación. 
eh, algunos que hemos podido aclarar gracias a un muy buen diálogo con, con el Ministerio de Trabajo, eh, que nos permitió por vía de reglamentación de la ley aportar un poco de equilibrio y claridad a la norma. Eh, especialmente quiero mencionar eh, la importancia de establecer plazos y requisitos objetivos para ejercer el derecho de reversión. Esto es algo que eh, parcialmente se pudo resolver en cuanto al ejercicio del derecho de reversión desde el, tra el trabajador, pero no se ha aclarado aún la facultad de, de ejercerlo desde el empleador y va a ser muy importante lo que se pueda decir desde los convenios colectivos para esto y desde los acuerdos y, y los contratos en, entre particulares. Y también se han aclarado algunas excepciones del concepto estricto de jornada y del derecho de desconexión. Eh, fue muy importante para nosotros que se pudiera entender en la naturaleza de los equipos que operan en distintos usos, usos horarios, las necesidades de conexión entre distintos eh, turnos en las plantas industriales, eh, o eh, actividades con una naturaleza como las guardias pasivas, los trabajadores de soporte, que pueden requerir comunicaciones fuera de lo que se define como una jornada habitual. Eh, un reto que... Que, que es muy importante para nosotros, eh, y escuchaba más temprano como en el caso español se hacen 22 referencias en la norma a la negociación colectiva, no contamos las referencias que se hacen en la ley argentina, pero sin duda también son muchas, eh, y tenemos por delante eh, la necesidad de profundizar eh, en la negociación colectiva para, para trabajar en cláusulas normativas, y no, en, y no solo en, en cláusulas más de tipo salarial o, o paritarias, como, como llamamos en Argentina a nivel colectivo sectorial. Hoy en Argentina tenemos convenios muy modernos eh, que incluyen instituciones como la jornada laboral promedio o la polivalencia funcional, pero la realidad de la mayoría de los convenios colectivos en Argentina es que no se modifican hace, hace muchas décadas eh, e incursionar en algunas discusiones normativas eh, incluye una serie de complejidades porque muchas otras cuestiones deben ser adaptadas a, a las nuevas formas de organización del trabajo. Eh, somos eh, un país que tiene una gran tradición de diálogo social y de mucho diálogo bipartito eh, y creemos que hay, hay algunos elementos que, que pudimos ver durante la pandemia que nos dan señales positivas sobre cómo podemos llegar a enfrentar eh, este desafío de regulación a, a nivel colectiva eh, durante la pandemia pudimos negociar protocolos de prevención, incluso cláusulas de suspensión a nivel sectorial, eh, con, con verdaderos consensos sectoriales y con mucha seriedad y compromiso, eh, pero de nuevo veremos si se puede avanzar en, en normas que regulen el trabajo remoto conectado en, en, en particular, o si seguirá siendo una cuestión pendiente. Eh, y por último, el último desafío que quiero mencionar, eh, no he sido extensiva, pero de última, eh, si hay preguntas sobre algunos temas puedo mencionar otros. Eh, tiene que ver con la salud y la seguridad en el trabajo de las personas que, que trabajan en forma remota. Eh, en circunstancias donde los empleadores tenemos un control limitado sobre las medidas de prevención y donde aparecen nuevas preocupaciones sobre riesgos psicosociales asociados a algunas formas de trabajo eh, o incluso a, a la posibilidad de dilución entre los límites entre la vida personal y la vida laboral. El Ministerio de Trabajo ha encargado a la Superintendencia de Riesgos de Trabajo, que es la agencia pública eh, que regula eh, los riesgos del trabajo en Argentina, que se elabore un informe eh, evaluando los riesgos de estas, de estas formas de trabajo, pero nosotros creemos que acá hay un llamado muy importante a las organizaciones de empleadores eh, para participar activamente en en estas etapas de, de definición y de evaluación de riesgos y compartir las experiencias de los sectores productivos que, que han sido pioneros en adoptar estas modalidades, eh, porque son los que han innovado en estas cuestiones y los que pueden aportar soluciones eh, y técnicas de gestión de riesgos con probada eficacia. Entonces, eh, vemos que es muy importante mantener el diálogo con con las agencias eh, nacionales para, para incidir tempranamente en estas definiciones. Eh, y también en estos sectores que decía son pioneros, es donde podemos encontrar una narrativa de oportunidades de teletrabajo para algunos grupos de personas que han sufrido más duramente las consecuencias de la pandemia, como las mujeres o los jóvenes o las personas con alguna discapacidad. Eh, por un lado, en cuanto a la inclusión de las mujeres, 
eh, en ciertos sectores se permite trabajar con horarios interrumpidos y eso cambia la visión tradicional de la jornada y permite la inclusión en el mercado de trabajo y puede beneficiar a las personas que cumplen con tareas de cuidado en el hogar. La ley argentina también tiene algunas eh, definiciones especiales para las personas con, con tareas de cuidado. Eh, eh, y también es, es cierto que hay que decir que eh, debe trabajarse mucho en una gestión adecuada de los tiempos de trabajo para prevenir este fenómeno que mencionaba antes, eh, donde se pueden borrar los límites entre la vida personal y la, la vida familiar. Pero también es el interesante derecho, decir... El, el derecho a la desconexión del que antes hablábamos, Laura. El eh, derecho a la desconexión, pues claro. El derecho a la desconexión es por lo que tengo que ser un poco estricto con los tiempos. Yo creo que has ha hecho referencia a todos los temas, eh, la seguridad y salud, al tema de las condiciones de trabajo, negociación colectiva. Bien interesante, bien interesante. Yo tengo una pregunta. Uh, I have a question for all of you. Uh, prof the professor Pere de los Cobos has just left, uh, and, uh, and I also want to thank him. Uh, but... Uh, I, I, I refer to this question to, uh, and there are many other questions in the chat function, and I saw that, uh, but many of them I think I have been answered, but if not, we'll follow up. And we always follow up the questions, eh? in IOE, at least in our work. The question is, where is this balance between what needs to be regulated and what not, doesn't need to be regulated? It's a tricky question, but uh, if you can briefly refer to that, my instance, to what extent I have uh, a right to the reversibility or not? Or to what extent I come and, and I should be, I should be as employer, be able to uh, request my worker to, you know, to, to have a different working time setting in a, in a remote work. What's the right balance and what not to do uh, as a policymaker in order to design, not, in order to have a backlash in, 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 in good telework policies? So I know that's a complicated question, but uh, uh, just feel free uh, to send a message, a, a kind of last message on, on that matter, and, uh, and, and we can keep on five more minutes, and that's, that, that would be okay. Uh, John, I will start with you. You're the first one, and then we'll follow the same order. Okay, sure, for sure. Um, obviously, that's a really tough question. I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. If there was, I think it would already have been done. Um, I personally, and this is me speaking personally, not, not on behalf of the ILO, I personally have always liked um, the European Framework Agreement on Telework, which dates all the way back from 2002. Why do I like it? Because it was negotiated in social partnership um, at European level. And I have to say, and this is my, again, my personal opinion, that it stood the test of time in ways, frankly, that a lot of agreements don't stand the test of time. Because one of the reasons I think is because it was uh, structured enough that it provided pretty strong guidance on what the key elements are. And I don't have time to go into all those key elements, but I'm sure you know very well what it contains. Um, and many of those same elements are in the guide I developed for the ILO. It's not an accident because that was an inspiration. It's been an inspiration for my work. But I personally like the idea to the extent that you have social partners, you don't always have um, representative social partners to negotiate this, to do this and provide an overall framework, that's great. If not, I think it's important for the government to provide an overall framework. I like the idea of a more flexible framework. That doesn't mean the wild, wild west. That doesn't mean do whatever the hell you want, but a really a framework solid framework which provides specific guidance but at the same time leaves the details to be worked out um uh, at, at 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 you know a sectoral level or at organizational level as needed and i say organizational level because this isn't only the private sector this public sector organizations too so it's pretty much everybody you know um and of all different sizes so you got very large multinational corporations which already have telework policies. You have very small enterprises, which of course did all this informally. So I like the idea of providing this flexible framework, ideally um, in a negotiated uh, social partnership, uh, if not um, by the government, but a flexible framework with which outlines the key things which have to be respected um, and then leaves the details. Um, I think it's a very, very wise answer. And also the music that you are playing is quite uh, is quite uh, good for. I mean, I really like. I mean, I have to say, I, I was in the negotiating table in the European framework, by the way. Oh, I didn't know that. This I, was. I, the, that, I had no I idea. Lost. I had no idea. But I, I was just, there. I just, li I just like it. <laughs> I was there, and I was. Uh, but the what you are saying, we are not going to use against that. 
I guess you don't worry about that. <laughs> in the case that we hear this music in the ALO. But that's, that's really what, what we want. I mean, this kind of let focus on the basic and, and, and let's put the regulation there, but at the same and make sure that uh, it's properly implemented and give the details to other, you know, I mean, uh, to other instances. But uh, anyway, uh, Peter, uh, what's your approach on what not to do? <laughs> yes, now it's very, very hard to add uh, something, uh, something new to, to the difficult question uh, because John already gave a, I think the best answer possible in my view. If I just bring in one, one aspect to this, because obviously I, I think uh, we agree that uh, it's good to bring about regulation at the government level that is negotiated and agreed upon with all the social partners, employer side, employee side. This is what we have been hearing from the survey from both uh, groups that uh, they want to be part of the the um the creation of new laws and regulations that adapt to the situation that's 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 fully agreed on just one extra thing i wanted to bring in is that probably the bargaining power of the different players plays a key role in determining okay is it going to be more um, telework in some sectors or it's going to be more um so it's going to be more what the employees want or more what the employers want it's going to be a relationship that's played out on the labor market the bargaining power so Governments should probably play, um, play attention to the fact if the bargaining power of one player is too strong or too weak. For instance, if uh, there is a sector where um, workers are in very high demand, probably the workers will uh, have the upper hand. But if there's another sector where you know, workers are in abandoned um, supply, probably governments should pay, pay attention to ensure that they also are protected to minimum degree so that employers do not uh, you know, abuse, abuse uh, too much the strong bargaining power in the situation. So just wanted to bring in this labor market aspect that probably depends on the specific sectors, labor market in a specific country as well. That's a very, good, very good point. Thank Thank you. Uh, and we have a question for Farol, our member in Bangladesh. Uh, he's saying in the manufacturing sector, how are you going to implement telework for this? Uh, it will depend, and also you'll have to find also this balance, which is much more detailed. Uh, Ivan, uh, what's your advice not to do? So, well, what, what not to regulate is uh, certainly you cannot regulate uh, individual behavior, but uh, uh, you can uh, regulate uh, uh, obligations and uh, the same obligations the workers they have in the office they should have them also at home as the employer has the obligations to provide equipment, machines, instructions. So the workers also have the obligations to comply with the health and safety rules. And uh, uh, in the terms of teleworking, even there, they can take even, even more obligations to, to do some self checks and to do some self things with support of employer make sure they don't set the things in fire, that they have electrical safety, that they set up their machines properly and their workplaces properly with support and the advice of the employer. You, you know, one of my first experience with telework discussions was already in, in 2000, 2002, because labor inspectors were requiring to uh, a big multinational uh, to, to oblige their workers to have extinguishers in their homes. Um, which was quite an interesting discussion. I mean, how do you adapt the health and safety regulation that you have in the office to the workplace, isn't it? Uh, and also in working time, you cannot have the same. But as you're right, in terms of principles, we should apply the same logic to the workplace uh, and uh, in terms of regulated and non-regulated. But there's also- too many, too many too many cables in the apartment next door got burned yeah. because of too many cables because of teleworking. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Uh, Amidou. Et d'après ton expérience, euh, et tenant compte qu'ici on n'a pas de votre gouvernement, ce que ce qu'on ne peut pas, ne doit pas faire. Mm. Sur quoi je voudrais insister, c'est que même s'il faut être flexible sur ces questions-là, il faut tout de même que la responsabilité de fixer les horaires du travail, comme également les questions de santé, sécurité au travail, relève de la responsabilité de l'employeur. Et ça, c est, c est, c est, ça ne devrait pas être négociable. Bon, maintenant, euh, on peut rentrer dans une discussion interne euh, au sein, dans le cadre d'un dialogue social, mais non seulement ça doit rester au niveau de l'employeur, mais également ça ne peut pas s'imposer au niveau des branches ou d'accords collectifs. Cas par cas, euh, ces questions euh, devraient être réglées, euh, comme également euh, l'employeur le, aura également comme obligation de respecter la durée, la durée horaire 
normale du travail, ça c'est une obligation euh, qu'il a, et également de respecter le droit euh, de la déconnexion du travailleur. Je pense que c'est un peu comme ça que, que j'aborderai cette question-là. Flexibilité, mais également euh, que tout soit bien, bien normé en quelque sorte. Je pense que c'est le point euh, auquel faisait référence le professeur, c'est-à-dire la capacité d'organisation de, de temps de travail. Bien sûr, hein, idéalement, il y a toujours un accord avec les travailleurs, mais afin de compte, la, la décision finale de l'employeur, parce que je dois organiser mes ressources. Okay? Ça, c'est un, un, point, un point essentiel. Et les horaires, etc. Parce que tu as besoin aussi d'une disponibilité des travailleurs, afin de compte, même s'ils travaillent à distance. Laura, que no se debe hacer, du <rire> point de vue de la régulation es la última, eh, última palabra, puedes decir. Yo le diría al revés, ¿qué se debe hacer? Eh, ya, pero la pregunta es que no se debe. Que ya dijimos, bueno, que okay, lo formulo al revés, entonces. Eh, para mí hay que es muy importante reconocer esta naturaleza mixta, este híbrido que vemos que es el, el que más están eh, buscando las empresas, lo que más parece funcionar en muchos aspectos, y es algo que no se hizo en la ley argentina, y lo que no se debe hacer es limitar esta posibilidad de adaptación eh, y de, de ir definiendo cómo va a ser esta modalidad de trabajo remoto, híbrido o mixto eh, en el tiempo. Así que no, li, no limitar las capacidades organizativas de los empleadores ni la posibilidad de renegociar las condiciones de, de estos contratos de trabajo. Muy buen punto. Es decir, el, el reconocimiento de una realidad mixta. Es decir, el, el no reconocimiento, la negación, es la, la peor manera de... de salir adelante o de buscar soluciones. No? Thank you, thank you so much. We have many questions here. Uh, I want to thank all of you for, for joining us, for having this exchange. I want to thank my team. And I was a little bit tough with, uh, with Luis Rodrigo because I cut him. I, I said to him, listen, we have to go quickly. But he was making the presentation of the, of the findings that we did. So I really highly recommend Uh, all participants to read through the findings. It's not just the finding, it's also, you can see the different regulations in different countries. It's an excellent work. It's an excellent work. It's a result of a joint effort with Luis, with Rita Gig, and from our, one of our Asian experts who, who, who was joining and is no longer here now with us. He's no longer mean joining uh, virtually, but of course he's an IOA team, uh, a very active member. And then, Uh, I would like uh, also to thank very much the interpreters. Uh, they have done a really uh, very good work. Uh, and I have to say that I was listening to in French and in, in Spanish. I like to do that also for me. And it's an excellent, excellent, excellent work. Uh, of course, LOD, thank you so much always for being there and helping us with this technical support. We'll keep in touch. The document I have, we have produced is a live document and we'll be receiving more input from all of you and engaging with the ILO, with OECD, With WHO, I think that we are more, more and more, uh, we are closer, and of course with our members. Amadou, Laura, uh, incredible to have you with us. Have a good day and, uh, and disconnect. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Muchas gracias a todos. Hasta luego.